Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of Get The Behind Me, which is the moderately insane podcast slash video series where we are doing the ever so timely thing of deconstructing the Left Behind series and through it, the entire book of Revelation. As you can tell, we're all old folk who love to do this sort of thing. Joining me is our perpetually enjoyable cast of characters, the inevitable Courtney. Hi. Uh, and we have Scott, who is appearing via a Mario stand-in, uh, using the traditional rules of this series, whereby if you're not going to be on camera, you have to have a plushie for stand-in. Uh, over on the other side, we have got uh, Kay and Finn, who are joining us from the distant frozen north of Michigan, which actually I don't know how frozen it is now at this point. <laughs> I, I just always imagine it. More as like thawing, in, in the process of thawing. Ah, okay. And I haven't been outside in three months. Don't blame me. <laughs> I used to live in Michigan. I wouldn't want to go outside there either. <laughs> um, and of course, we are also joined now by um, Micah. And Micah, you're new to this particular series. You want to give a quick introduction? Hi, my name is Micah Belong. I am... Um, let me try that again. Hi, my name is Michael Belong. I am the pastor, uh, uh, the minister. Oh, goodness. What in the world am I saying? Hi, I'm Michael Deep Belong. And I'm... <laughs> Hi, I'm Michael Belong, and I'm the minister in charge of the Llama Pack, a group of people who have been left outside of the church. We were kicked out of the sheepfold, and so we uh, came and gathered anyway. And uh, we are queer, leftist, uh, all sorts of things, and we are producing a podcast that Don has been gracious to be a host on called The Word in Black and Red, which is reading the Bible from a leftist perspective. And I am here to help uh, tear down the bullshit that is evangelical theology and the fact that none of it has anything to do with any of these Bibles that I have here. And that's what we call shared goals. And for those of you who are watching this and don't know who I am, also how, first off, just like, I, I, please comment on that. Don't you know who he I, is? I would love to know how you watch, how you watch a video okay. series in the third episode for the church that I'm the pastor of and don't know, but I am Pastor Don. <laughs> I'm the pastor of Unfinished Community, who is the uh, the source of all of these crazy videos, among other things. Um, and we are the, uh, as far as I'm aware, the first open and affirming international church in our region of Japan, possibly the whole country, still not sure about that. So, you know, go us, I guess. Uh, in the meantime, we are going to be ripping a new one for evangelicals via the Left Behind series. Now, last time, last time on Get Thee Behind Me, <laughs> we tore our way through chapter one of this literary work of art. <laughs> That's probably the best way to put it, because a disaster it may be, but it is one hell of an artistic disaster. And I have to say, in chapter one, we got... So much stuff happening. Y'all remember what happened in chapter one, by the way? There's a lot to soak in because it's all so over the top. Yeah, it's it's not just over the top. Like, one of the things we've come to notice about these writers is that they are wildly inconsistent in the amount of content that they're likely to put in a given chapter. Uh, fair warning, there's far less happening in chapter two than happened in chapter one. Because in chapter one we got the introduction to all of our very pornographic main characters and their various <laughs> pornographic <laughs> relationships. Um, and then Fully we, loaded, 7.30. Yeah. And, <laughs> <exactly. laughs> and then we immediately went from there into a series of wildly improbable world-changing events. Uh, we got our introduction to Rayford Steele and his fully loaded 7.47, as you alluded to. We also got our introduction to uh, Buck, who just likes to report on the Times. Um, and he, we get this whole aside about his journey to Israel, where there's apparently an out of nowhere nuclear strike and massive military engagement from Russia, of all people, through their shared border, a thing we know they have. Um, and it's all deflected oh. by God, and everyone's reaction is kind of like, eh. You literally get divine <laughs> intervention to stop the largest nuclear strike in the history of creation. And everyone's just like, Huh, I wonder if there was something odd about that. <laughs> That's the story. And everyone's People back are stupid, point. but I'm not sure if they're quite that. I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> no, no. We all live through COVID in the West. We know. <laughs> so, you know, so that all happens. He gets on a plane and they're heading back to, I think Chicago is where they're heading back to. I, I forget. I Just think a, so. 
it doesn't really matter. They could be heading back to literally anywhere. It wouldn't really matter. Um, so yeah, heading... it is Chicago. Okay, yeah. So they are heading back to Chicago, and the plane is in the air, and people disappear. And um, by the way, throughout the whole first chapter, Rayford Steele is just generally bitching about his his uh, frigid wife and how terrible uh, Christians are when it comes to sex. Uh, he's not necessarily wrong, given the cultish uh, subset his wife has joined, but his accidental critique of purity culture notwithstanding, um, <laughs> it ends That's with... fantastic. <laughs> That's what it, it is. It didn't occur to me until just now, yep. Yeah. They're doing some things by accident here. They're saying the quiet parts out loud. Right? <laughs> it, it, it ends with the line, the terrifying truth was... The, the, the terrifying truth was that he knew all too well, Irene, his wife, had been right. He and most of his passengers had been left behind. We and have title yeah. bomb. Roll credits. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> so now we are leading into chapter two. Now, does anyone have any uh, fun notes before we get started? Anything you want to throw at us? No? Want to throw something at us, Scott? He's... Yeah, I got one. Okay. So... I mentioned before that like I don't have the same background with this book series as any of you. I've only known about it like through the zeitgeist basically and I thought it was a horror story written by Dan Brown. So that shows what I know going into this. Yeah, that would be so much better. It's about um, the apocalypse. How is it not a horror story? <laughs> um, but all that aside, th this book actually has two authors, right? Right. <laughs> You ever wonder about the creative process? Like, do you, do you think they ever like disagreed over a scene? Well, one of the critiques I've read for this book, uh, which I can't recommend enough, it's by an author by the name of uh, Fred Clark on Pathios uh, website. It's an older blog series, but it, it checks out. Um, I, I suggest <laughs> looking into that one if you have time. Uh, he highlights how Rayford Steele and Buck Williams are both avatars for the different authors. And they track pretty well to their kind of historical positions and ways of approaching their own self-image. Uh, so that's as far as as much as I know about it is, is that that these two characters are meant to be kind of fictionalized avatars of the two writers. All right. You write Rayford. I'll write Buck. Pretty much. <laughs> OK, good to know. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Which is kind of why I think every time we flash to a different character, like the style and everything changes differently. Like Rayford Steele was all about how much he desperately wanted to fuck. And then we switched to Buck. <laughs> we switched to Buck and it's like massive, impossible world building. I was so thirsty. So yeah. which one of these is the repressed one author then? I don't know. I think they both, <laughs> I mean, they both are in different ways and that'll come out later. Uh, because spoiler alert for what's going to happen in like I think like three or four chapters. Um, you know, you know, my name is Buck, and I'm here to write newspapers. Eventually, um, starts pretty much. I, I'm going to say soaking because I don't know what evangelicals do when they don't actually have sex. Um, but to uh, Rayford's uh, daughter, his college age daughter. It's been a long time oh, since I heard that word. Oh, yeah. College age isn't pedophilia. Oh. It's just creepy if you're way older. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> come on think about who we're talking about so that in mind let's go ahead and segue ourselves into the actual chapter two which i think you guys all have in front of you and we're starting with cameron williams who's still using his first name because he doesn't quite want to yet um sitting with the old lady uh in his in the seat next to him who's worried about my Harold, which is not actually Cameron. okay um, so which, which chapter are we into here we are in chapter okay. two uh, let's see if I can. So, and that was actually, oh, no, go ahead. sorry, that was actually kind of the one note I had on the chapter overall when I was just like looking back over it was Kay and I talked a lot about how, like, because we talked with the last chapter about how you can see, like, about how it's kind of hard to tell with like the sexualization of women, like how much of it is like because of how the authors see women and how much of it is like them like writing this character that sees women that way but we we talked a lot about how in chapter two you really get like more of this view into definitely how the authors view women because all of the women are just like running around hysterical like yeah. the whole time everyone from Hattie who like as as a flight attendant I'm sure she's seen some shit 
like um and then the old lady yeah but yeah and this is something that's uh relates to what scott was saying earlier too um this connects in a certain way to uh lahay's wife uh who as i understand at the time this was written was basically running whatever is on the other side of complementarianism for for women in the evangelical church like women are meant to be basically quiverful household basically baby cannons um and that whole movement now like, i know what i want for christmas <laughs> right now you so, don't want a baby cannon provide more people and care for all of them completely <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's not forget that evangelical evangelical Please tell me the mic picked that up yes Let's let's not forget that evangelicals <laughs> view vaginas as baby cannons in the same way that we understand video games like kitten cannon. Come on, please tell me someone got that old joke. Ah, go into old I java like games, play that joke. game, it's fun. Anyway, we're getting off topic. Mm -hmm. Back to the chapter. They they think women are nuts. That's beside the point. Uh, it isn't beside the point. It is the point. Um, so we also have... We have to be over-emotional or we can't be responsible for 100% of the emotional caretaking in our families. Uh -huh. <laughs> but there's also a thing to keep in mind, too, is that it's easy to lose sight of the fact that Rayford and Buck are meant to be the heroes of the piece. Because they act like... At, at this moment, at the end of chapter one, they've made the twist to, oh, God, we realized our wives were right. We have to live as good Christians. And they'll come to that conversion periodically throughout this book but in effect from this point on they're acting in ways that are supposed to be carefully heroic before they become full-on christians and are totally heroic um which gives you an insight into how these people think because they can only be marginally good people if they don't believe in jesus right jesus. yeah but from here on out like remember the last line of chapter one rayford knows he knows his wife was right so like he's he's fully on board with at least the understanding but he he acts in ways that are sadistic. Like you don't even necessarily realize it at first, but he's absolutely psychotic in the way he believes and that's being put forth as heroism. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and scroll forward. So we've got the interaction between uh, Buck and, and Harold's wife, who I don't think is ever given a name because why would you give a woman a name? Uh, I'm sure they give her a name at some point. I can't remember. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. Eventually, um, I want to say in chapter four or five, he finally gets home or something because this book has no concept of pacing. Yeah. So we get like about three or four pages of people just wandering around trying to figure out what's the deal with all of these clothes. And the, like, there's like three solid pages of this. Um, and they're, they're kind of highlighting it down. Um, I got to love this. Like, what do you make of it? First thing I thought was spontaneous combustion. Like, there's no fire <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> Why would you think of that? I don't think you understand what combustion means, my dude. Yeah. Also, um, why wouldn't the clothes be burnt up? But, right, okay. right. Like, there, there is- Clothes uh, are so much less flammable <laughs> than a live human. <laughs> there is a dearth of critical thinking happening here, which is consistent throughout. Um, so we get the wallet, you know. Yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> hey, so we get... up, why not? You've played you've played too many video games. You got to <laughs> loot the bodies. <laughs> exactly. So we get we get the back and forth in the plane. We get the back and forth between Rayford and various other planes, and eventually the tower. Um, and we see the beginnings of some conversational back and forth between Rayford and his co-pilot or first officer, whatever the hell they call it here, um, who, uh, fun, fun warning, is being shaped up to be kind of like a mini villain as we go into the next chapter. He'll, he'll eventually be killed off as evil people tend to be in this. Um, Unless the plane's crashing, don't bother me. <laughs> well, fun fact. Um, so he turns the plane back around, they head to Chicago. Um, and from here, yeah, you get, if you're not crashing, don't bother me. Um, then we get the news reports, okay? So I got to ask this question, and I want you guys to knock this around. In the event of a major apocalyptic scenario like this, would there be news reports? No, the reporters would all be raptured, I assume. <laughs> Says the reporter. <laughs> 
So, so this That's is just the worst what you part. need, babe, to cover an apocalypse. Too. <laughs> oh my god! After I think. I, hold, hold on, Micah, go ahead. <laughs> I think this is the worst line. Like the the worst part about this is that it's just so poorly written. And I and I don't know why I listen. I read this all as a child. I do know why because I was terrified. Right? It was a horror. It was a horror book that was meant to terrify me and keep me reading to keep me scared. Right? But but this line, even the newscasters' voices were terror filled as much as they tried to mask it. Now, I taught fifth grade writing, right? If a fifth grader brought me that sentence, I would say, great job. You've accomplished it. You've spelled everything correctly. Mm -hmm. Good job. Continue, right? But if anyone above a fifth grader brought me that sentence, I would say, rewrite that drivel and and just awful shit. Why in the world are you bringing this to me (laughs) to edit? Scott is on the floor. And this got (laughs) published and sold millions of copies because evangelicals eat this shit up because they can't accept culture from the outside because it is a system of power. If you control the people on the inside and what they think in a cult, then you can keep them believing whatever the hell you want them to believe, which is how all of this theology develops. Yeah. There's nothing good in, in the, the, the culture of the world. Nobody really has talent unless unless they believe in jesus like then their talent comes from god oh i'm (laughs) sorry yes shakespeare was absolute nonsense because he didn't have the right trinitarian theology Um, (laughs) (laughs) he was told he kept making up words (laughs) but no there's there's another piece of this there's another piece of this that is a bit more insidious that's going to become more and more apparent as we go through the next the rest of the chapter and into the next chapter which is that the authors don't see anyone other than the primary characters as functionally human. They're all NPCs. Um, So the news reporters continue to news report. When we actually get back to the airport, you know what you find there? I mean, we'll talk about this when we get there, but all the gate attendants are still doing their jobs. All the people in the club lounges are still doing their things. All the airport workers are still working. Nobody's rushing. They're essential workers. They need to shut up and do their jobs. Oh my God. (laughs) That's it. That's where it comes from. <laughs> yeah, I was going to well, say think... in response. So, what do you mean, Sonder? This is a Wendy's, sir. <laughs> Go ahead, Finn. <laughs> uh, just in response to the like question about reporters, I was going to say, as as the partner of like in, basically an independent reporter at this point who writes basically exclusively about like the kind of like crazy shit that you don't see covered i i feel like you would definitely like have some people out there like trying to report on it probably the the major networks though probably i don't know i i go back and forth on whether or not they would be they would be like we must like like yeah this is like prime like prime story like we can make so much money off of this or if they would have just like it's the end of the down. world let's i also think like you would have to assume that there would be like government responses going on kind of beneath the surface as well which might include telling the media to like not speculate too much yet because they're trying to prevent a panic <laughs> i mean they can try but like fox news is a thing they do they do, uh, do mm-hmm. speculation 24 <laughs> 7 in, like, in fairness know, this is democrats in the white house <gasps> did you hear that i did not know what was that sorry i said so what you're saying is it depends on whether a democrat's in the white house or not <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> it's also worth noting that this was written in the 90s so the the dramatic interplay between fox deliberately causing a panic in the way it does now wasn't as much of a thing yet so some of that can be excused for the time some not all some but also like we can we can point out (laughs) but also we can point out the fact that like there are thousands of tragedies that happen around the world all the time that we get almost absolutely not almost no reporting (laughs) on um in the west like we don't hear about what's going on in malaysia we don't hear what's happening in burma we don't hear what's happening in yemen we don't hear what's happening in palestine Mm -hmm. all of these places where hundreds of thousands of people are dying every day that we don't hear about because it doesn't serve the capitalist interests of of the ruling class right? right and so here in this story i think one of the points that they're trying to make 
is uh, that they believe so few people are truly Christian that they will disappear and it will almost, and society will keep on running because it'll be so few people who are truly chosen by God to, to be raptured. And this is an interesting contradiction that's going to play out in the next uh, kind of chapter or two, because you're right. That is the core belief at the heart of this whole Schofieldist evangelical perspective. However, the way it's written for the next few chapters is like half of everybody disappeared. Like there's fire, there's crashes, everything is screwed up. Yeah. Yeah. So there's That's a kind of- what I wanted to comment on. I'm like, this is a ridiculous portion of the world that they have disappear in this. Mm-hmm. So like, and of course, anybody writing something like this is going to be like, there's lots of good Christians here in America. So it would have affect America a lot and it would be on American. There's no way it wouldn't be on American news. Yeah. Um, as far as I think if nothing else is the fact that was... all the children disappeared. Yeah. Like, that, that would probably, like, basically a footnote. Like, it, it's a footnote for everything. <laughs> oh, also, the kids are gone. Like, why is that <laughs> all the children? Thing? <laughs> and I love the like, throwaway love... line where he's like, and the Pope disappeared. No one expected it. But the, even the Pope disappeared. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Kind of yeah, love you think that. They would talk about the Pope disappearing. Now, I wonder why they 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 wrote the like. This is a theological question I was never able to sufficiently answer. But I wonder why they wrote the Pope as having disappeared. Were they saying the Pope was secretly an evangelical Schofieldist, or were they making yes. some sort of yes. weird apostolic succession claim, saying that well, he's direct from Peter, so he's probably in anyway? No, I was so thinking. It, oh, go ahead. No, go, go ahead, ahead. Courtney. Um, I was thinking more along the lines of like an olive branch to the uh, to the Catholics. Like some of you went to, but the Pope did some good stuff. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like yes, you don't have so it quite there... right, but you had enough of it. So you, and, and you did enough of the things that we think you should have done. So you get to go to heaven. And they probably want to sell this to Catholics, or at least not piss <laughs> yeah. them off. Yeah, Fair exactly. Point. Yeah, the, and they have they have a little uh, explanation basically that they that G, the the Pope actually had had a spiritual experience that transformed him instead of just being born into it and like you know has this all thing but but it leads into the fact that LaHaye and Jenkins are what are called landmarkists. Now, landmarkists believe that there was a secret church within the real church, the the, the Catholic church, that secretly believed all the right things, exactly what they believe, all the way back to Jesus. Now, this idea that there is a secret church inside the real church is called landmarkism, right? That basically there's an unbroken line of true believers who believe exactly what I believe, the way that I believe it, uh, understanding it the same way I do as a as a 21st century person as they did way back then, speaking a different language in a different culture with totally different re- religious organizations and all these sorts of things. Um, they believe the exact same things that I do. So I must be right because it's a secret church, a secret knowledge within it. Now, what do you call people who believe in a secret knowledge that can only be passed down through the sacred teachings of their particular teachings? Gnostics. Oh, sorry. <laughs> heretics of the early church, the Gnostics. So this this yeah. idea is playing out here in this story that there is a secret knowledge that you have to have to be able to avoid this terrible outcome that has been rejected by the church from the very beginning of its existence. And this is something- I for those of you been... We are going to go super long, aren't we? Uh, no, we're actually doing good on time. So don't worry about that. Oh! Yeah. Oh, heavens, great. sorry. Great. I apologize. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to throw this last point in here before we move on to the next section. But uh, for those of you who've been who've been kind of following my rants on evangelicals and whatnot, you're probably noticing that landmarkism is something I haven't really talked about yet. And that's because, as I may have mentioned several times, there are so many interconnected heresies and stuff things in the evangelical movement that I'm always going to miss stuff. There's, there's stuff I don't know that's buried in there. So like... Every time we try, the, part of the reason I asked Mike on here is, is they've got more knowledge on this stuff than I do on some some of them because uh, they've been studying Revelation for a while. Um, so, like, there's so many interconnected heresies within the evangelical movement, none of which are, and I don't say this lightly, none of which are considered Christian. None of them. So they this, consider themselves Christian. Yeah, and fun fact, that's not how you decide whether something's Christian. Um, how do you, you to, no i'm gonna get into the deep philosophical things how do you decide what is christian 
uh, we there's two ways to look at it. One, there's like we have a whole list of criteria that are generally accepted by the whole of the church. At the very least, the whole universal church agrees to the Apostles' Creed and its component parts. Uh, so if you're not an adherent to that, then you're definitely not a Christian. But secondly, and this is a conversation I had with a, a conservative just a couple of days ago, is if your movement is connected to the larger church, like if you came off of us at some point or are a branch off of that church, you would qualify as Christian, if, if vaguely. Uh, evangelical Christianity in America was more or less self-generating along a political movement that took cultic Pentecostals that were broken off from the church and all of these weird heresies that we threw out a long time ago and formed their own thing separate from the church for political motivations. Um, so that, that I constitute as a different thing. Uh, but in any case, that's a discussion for an entirely different video because, oh boy, that will bring us over time. So Sorry. My bad. That, being, <laughs> that having been laid down, let's move on to the next section. And for this part, I have a question that's directed specifically to Kay and Scott which is hang on let him come back he was stepping aside for something I, that's fine he's got a question for you okay. yeah sorry as about that reporters for you and for Kay. yeah as reporters do you inherently have the ability to disassemble seat back communication uh systems and assemble hacking devices out of them because i did not know that was in a reporter's tool bag and holy shit that's what he does here not as a reporter no not as a reporter i, mean, I, no. I feel that? like it's hard like in, that was before you like before you were you just you to be around. cut open a couple wires and then tie yeah. the blue one to the yellow one I mean, and then so you whisper hacking. i'm in <laughs> that that's hacking right like, as far as i know yeah, yeah i mean i i don't know any better than that like that's how i was trained in reporter school right one of the one of the textbooks on my shelf is literally like computer assisted reporting meant to teach journalists how to use computers. It's like from back when you know mm -hmm. people didn't have them all the time. So I I don't feel like this group of people are teaching them like the basics of how to yeah use like <laughs> how to how to use an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. Now I gotta I gotta ask this, as as a follow up to that, and this is for everybody else. Um, how believable is it? that in the midst of an actual apocalyptic rapture scenario, the freaking stewardess is going to say, don't patronize me, sir. I can't sit here and let you vandalize airline property. <laughs> How likely I'm is that? The I'm stewardess play who is otherwise on this one. Ooh. If at all possible, I'm gonna play devil's advocate on this one. All right. Some people, uh, some people have like a Shinji Akari response. Like when they're pressed, it's like, okay, <laughs> I'm just gonna do what's expected of me. I'm going to let other people make my decisions for me and I'm going to go by by this set of rules and then that means that I'm safe and there are less decisions for me to make in this scenario. Um, they're implying, yeah, some weird path. They shouldn't all be doing that. I would think a couple of them would be like, well, we have to keep helping these people because that's our job as stewardesses. Like, I'm sure that's some people's coping, coping mechanism. It's not the entire flight crew. <laughs> And then the, the follow up, which that, brings me to my favorite character, okay. the uh, drunk guy in the seat next to Buck, who's just like, oh man, the apocalypse is going on. He's just like, dude, I got a lot going on right now. Leave me alone. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that, that, that really was a great part. Now, we're uh, we're a little bit earlier for, for this for this uh, conflict in history, yet, yeah, because, again, this is being written in the 90s. But personally, I read this, I read that as a stand-in for, for progressive Christians and dealing with evangelical bullshit. Like, come on, man, just give me another drink. I'm too, I am too sober for this shit. Um, all right. So the stand-in you know, for the reader. <laughs> there for we the reader. go. Yeah, stand in for the reader. I am gonna need more of this one. <laughs> right. So we get into the holding pattern over O'Hare. Yeah. Um, and now we're making our way down into Chicago. Everybody's worried. Everybody's scared. Um, let's see. So, yeah, they're about to land in Chicago. And this is where we start to get our picture of what's going on on the ground. Um, so setting aside Buck's response of dealing with Hattie by basically flirting her and then offering her preferential treatment like that. That's Listen, their beautiful Hattie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the the their view of negotiation. Um, what does a so, woman most want to be called in the world? Beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. That's how we've got it set up. Yeah. So then you get this this kind of 
almost taste. poetic image put together where they cut through the cloud bank, they can see the Chicago area, and just like everything's on fire. So this is where we start to see that that cognitive dissonance we were talking about earlier, where, oh my God, everybody's gone and it's caused bus crashes and plane crashes and people are dying and oh my God, it's an actual factual apocalypse. Everything's jammed up, nothing's going to work. And but there's look, still some chick working the gate for Delta. Delta. Yeah, that yeah. I question. Look, I, I gotta say, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I've actually been present in a major metropolis during a global level na national disaster. So I was in Tokyo during the, the March 11th. Uh, and that was, first off, I was a hell of a day. Um, and that was one of those days where you did get things like gridlock and buses were locked in places. There were fires. I mean, half of Chiba was on fire at that point. There were oil fires all over the place. The, uh, tsunami you may have heard about. Um, you know, shit happened. The power plant. Yeah. And even in the midst of all of that, like, things were still reasonably well organized. So we're talking about a situation and there were tens of thousands of people killed in that event. Uh, in down in the city, obviously the casualties were much less, but it was still an 8.8, 8.9 when it hit the city. And aside from gridlock and uh, some supply chain issues, everything was generally fine. We, there was some a lot of repair work that had to be done after, but we didn't see this level of what's being painted here. And this is like the largest earthquake in human history, even in Tohoku itself, prior to the tsunami, which you know is a different thing here. Like the earthquake happened, the disaster was over, and sporadic fires and stuff, obviously some shit went down with the nuclear plant, which I, I would think that would be where you would want to focus with this sort of thing. Like all of the nuclear regulators suddenly disappeared and Three Mile Island suddenly got a lot worse. Um, something like that would make sense. But everywhere, all, there, everything- There everywhere, are no Christians with advanced degrees, Don. If you have a PhD, oh yeah, I forgot about that. If you have a PhD, you've lost God. Mikey, you keep killing my husband over here. <laughs> Deep cuts. Yeah, you're not wrong. But if, so yeah. if you're smart enough to realize how stupid this book is, you yes. don't really you know don't Jesus. Really know. <laughs> oh, wow. Yo, that is it. Oh, that's, that's it. We're done. That's the theme for today. And that is where we end is with their making landfall. Um on in Chicago and the expressways, the do airport. We, do we get Buck failing to use a slide? No, yeah. that's in the next chapter. And oh. I don't have words about that because it's hilarious. Spoilers. So any last minute things we want to fire off at this one before we call it for this episode? Let's just fire it off into the sun. This chapter was, it was a drag to get through. <laughs> well, oh, I think that, yeah, the first I, one was more fun. Was that, was that a dab or a hand, oh. Finn? No, I was like, uh, Courtney said, fire, fire it off into the sun. Just <laughs> perfect. Perfect. All right. So that being said, let's go ahead and call this episode to a close. If you've watched this far, congratulations. You've watched us rant about, I'm going to say book for 20 some odd minutes. And I'm glad that you're still with us. Uh, if you want to, if you want to see more, um, Links to everything are down in the description. Our, our church community is based partly on Discord, partly in person. So if you're watching this from Japan, we got church services, we got Bible studies, we got all sorts of in-person stuff starting to fire off. Here. <laughs> I know I'm making it sound way cooler than it probably is, but wacky and inflatable too, man. Really cool, especially yeah. now that more of you are joining us. Thank you. I know. And if you aren't in Japan, that's the point that Courtney's making is Discord server. It's a whole church in and of itself. We've got people all around the world that are doing this stuff with us. Come and join us. Links to everything are down below in the description. Uh, and as I always invite Courtney to invite you to do. Oh, yeah. Like, share, and subscribe. Woohoo! Yeah, that stuff actually really, really does help because we live and breathe on YouTube. So if you can do that thing, we'd really appreciate it. That being said, I want you guys to all have a wonderful word or wonderful week. Uh, look on lovingly at uh, Kay and Finn's cat there, who is adorable. Uh, and have yourselves a great week. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye, everybody. Bye. See ya. Bye.